some sort of effort to protect the public should have been undertaken. Let's look at um, Exhibit 378. This one I've seen before. And uh, how did you come to see it? I remember this. Uh, I have a copy of this. I remember this like yesterday with a group of our secretaries in the office stuffing letters and using a machine that was sealing, like they didn't have to lick all the letters. And this was mailed out to everybody somehow that was a patient of Dr. Durrani's to notify him that his practice location was changing. Yes, I agree with that. They had a lot of explaining to do in 2013. They had a lot of explaining to do in 2008. They had a lot of explaining to do in 2007. And they got a lot of explaining to do today. And uh, what is it that you think that they should be explaining at this point? They should be explaining why they didn't protect the public. Do you, based upon your experience with Dr. Durrani uh, from the years that he worked with you at Children's Hospital, have an opinion about his reputation for uh, truthfulness and honesty in the uh, community? Yes, I do. And what's that opinion? I think he was an unethical sociopath. And you brought this to the attention of Eric, Dr. Eric Wall? I brought that to the attention of everybody in the room. Uh, this, so within the context of what we would call pre-op and post-op teaching conference, x-rays would be put up, a uh, discussion would be presented by the resident who had reviewed the patient's chart and would talk about pre-operative you know, symptoms, et cetera, what kind of treatments had been used beforehand. And case after case after case is going up of children with this, this, this thing called spondylolysis. All right. So did you raise this with uh, people other than uh, this... Uh, review with your uh, fellows and your residents? Absolutely. I brought it up with, uh, with Eric Wall, my division director, other partners that were in attendance. This, was, uh, uh, this, this wasn't couched in secrecy. And um, other than Dr. Wall, whose attention did you bring this to? Uh, this was brought to the attention of Steve Muthing, that safety officer. I remember that. I don't know if that email is in here. But I know that I sent it to Steve because I respected Steve a lot, and he'd had the, he was in the new, new position of being that safety guy. How did Dr. Wall react to your um, bringing this to his attention? I would say not forcefully or definitively. Uh, the spondylolysis question that we're discussing was one of the first things that really got my attention that I said, wow, this, this is out of bounds. This is different. I conducted research on the topic and published research on the successful non-operative treatment of, of the problem. And did you make uh, complaints to anyone other than Dr. Wall? We had the hierarchy, which was my, uh, my division director and the people, you know, and so it was Eric's, I saw it as Eric's job to take it up from there. I have my own email record of my discussions um, suggesting to him outside reviewers who might be able to look at such cases. I uh, told him Dr. Aziz Khan um, was our chief of surgery at the time. And I, I remember using phraseology that said the only thing worse than taking this to Dr. Aziz Khan would be not to take it to Dr. Aziz Khan. Did you have a conversation other than with Dr. Wall, uh, and I'm talking about with other doctors at uh, Children's Hospital, and we're going to exclude Dr. Wall the residents and the fellows. Sure. So there was the, 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 the people that we were supposed to educate that you mentioned, the residents and fellows. The partners at the time that would attend those meetings beyond Dr. Wall was Alvin Crawford. I believe there was a, a good period of time there where Dennis Roy may have overlapped still. Uh, Janichi Tamai was one of our junior partners that overlapped during some of those years. And another partner that's no longer with, with us is a female surgeon named Twee Doe. Uh, who was uh, in a bunch of those meetings at, during those years. Did anyone at the pre-op, post-op teaching conference uh, ever tell you to be quiet and stop being so critical of Dr. Durrani? Yes, they did. And who was that? I call this the low point. So this whole thing that we're discussing today, hours and hours around this table with 15, 15 plus people, uh, is what I have described to my colleagues in the country as the low point of my professional career. As Eric Wall found the way to, commit to, to speak to me and say, Chuck, you've been asked to be quiet. To which, to which I said, Eric, 
the day that I'm quiet in this conference, you better check a pulse. Because as long as it's my job to teach these residents and these fellows, the next generation of practitioners, how to be ethical and to be evidence-based practitioners, I will continue to speak up. And at the time that Eric Wall told you to be quiet and stop being critical of Dr. Drani, he was division director at the Cincinnati Children's? Yes, he was. And my best estimate, my best guess would be that there was a short list of people who would tell him to say such a thing to me. And those people might have been Peter Clayton. They might have been Richard Aziz Khan. Okay? And it might have been Fred Reichman. But it's hard to imagine who else could give such a directive to my slightly older orthopedic brother. Based upon your personal knowledge and what we've covered here today, did Westchester UC Health, through their staff and management and their medical executive committee, know Dr. Durrani had issues at Children's Hospital before he applied for privileges there in 2009? Objection. So you're asking me if UC Health? Yeah, if they knew. The institution that trained him in his residency? UC Health is University of Cincinnati and Peter Stern and the residency, right? So given that, the question, what, what is your answer? Is heck yeah, they should. How could they not know? Eric Wall had a funny comment, a striking comment. He said, in every category of humans, he said, you could take baseball umpires, you could take Mormons, okay, a, a, wonderful, uh, a wonderful group of folks. You could take any, and he said, and there's a certain percentage of sociopaths in every category of humans, you can find them. Maybe in aboriginals in, in Australia, you could find who the sociopaths are. And those comments were made in direct reference to Dr. Durrani. I would, again, like to reiterate the observation of significant concerns about Dr. Durrani's surgical indications was voiced by many members of the Cincinnati medical community, all of which were relayed to our chairman, Dr. Peter J. Stern. This subsequently was brought up in a formal meeting and discussion with Dr. Durrani in the fall of 2008 during his employment with Children's Hospital Medical Center of Cincinnati. Uh, were you in attendance at that meeting? No, sir. Were you familiar with that meeting at the time that it was occurring? No, sir. Did um, Dr. Durrani uh, leave his employment at Children's Hospital Medical Center uh, shortly after uh, the fall of 2008. To the best of my knowledge, the timing was within several days. Well, I would say what I noticed was aggressive, an, an aggressive uh, pattern even during the board collection period. Um, um, and after he cleared his boards, as we would say, uh, I would say it, it was even, it was much more striking. And what do you mean by uh, an aggressive pattern to his practice? I mean stuff that I had never seen before. One of the most horrible cases was one of the very last patients who suffered permanent paralysis at our hospital. Uh, the principle was that I saw behavior uh, uh, and support offered to him that was striking. People like Peter Clayton, uh, Sandy Singleton, and other uh, business decision makers built a machine around him. We never had spine nurses like we did until Durrani was there. We never had schedulers that I know of that hung out in the, in the clinic just to schedule the cases as they rolled out. And I sure as heck never saw a surgeon have two ORs three days a week. A, a dramatic change in attitude, in my opinion, that was illustrated by our business director, Sandy Singleton who quite famously became immensely focused on the money that was rolling into our division as a result of Dr. Durrani's activities. She seemed to be quite pleased. And at or about that same time, it became common knowledge in our office even about prominent gifts that were given to Sandy Singleton by Dr. Durrani, including an infamous mink coat. Has Children's Hospital ever told you or other doctors and nurses that you're aware of not to talk about Dr. Durrani? Absolutely. Can the gag order has gone out no less than three times over the years. You don't have to talk to too many nurses who could speak freely who would give you that story. And, and what was It's the a joke. It says, he whose name we shall not say. Well, my personal favorite and one that I've shared with friends over the years was after Dr. Durrani's departure. He'd been out for a few months, maybe a quarter. 
and we were having, we must have been having on one of our admin meetings uh, enough that Peter Clayton was there. And I remember it like yesterday. He said, what's happened to your spine revenue? There's a big drop off. And I said, Peter, we're, on, we're now only doing indicated surgery. There were very frequent meetings. He would meet with, I don't know, three, four uh, in industry representatives a, a week sometimes. So when surgeons become um, the beneficiaries of these companies that are dishing out money, it's been shown very clearly to change surgeon behavior. And I reported him once anonymously to the FBI. And do you have any personal knowledge of whether or not Dr. Droney spoke truthfully about patients having already gone through conservative treatment before doing surgery? Uh, yes, I do. And is there a significance of timely completing procedure and operative reports? Well, absolutely. Uh, <clears throat> you, uh, com completing the, med uh, the, the medical node or the op node or procedure node, whatever you want to call it, has uh, significant clinical ramifications. Okay, and now let me ask you this, doctor. Are you aware of any occasions where a patient was told by Dr. Durrani that he was going to operate on, let's say, one part of the body, but he would end up operating somewhere else? Yes, absolutely. Um, so they were, they were educated, uh, for the most part, on what was... Uh, what was going on, uh, whether it was accurate or not, that's a different, that's a different situation. Um, and then they were also told on what the procedure was, but a lot of the stuff was pretty high level uh, procedures. And so a lot of the times when the patients would come back to me, they would say, you know, they didn't truly understand what, what the implications of their pathology was, nor uh, did they truly understand what this procedure was, except for the fact that they needed to have the surgery. Doctor, did Dr. Durrani ever coerce patients into having surgery? When you tell a person that their head's going to fall off or they're going to be paralyzed or they're not going to walk again or they're going to lose control of their bowel and bladder and they're going to be pooping and peeing on themselves, I think you're basically telling that person you need to do this. We would see, you know, we would have our impressions as to what mild or moderate stenosis was. Uh, we would see the radiology reports. And then when you see Dr. Durrani's uh, dictated notes, his would be on the other end of the spectrum, calling something maybe what, what, what we had claimed as maybe mild or moderate, as something as moderate to severe. And um, a lot of uh, you know, him being tied to Westchester, he would get a lot of the uh, patients from Westchester, uh, you know, people that simply went to the ER you know, for an exacerbation of pain or you know, new, new back pain. They would, go, they would be sent over for, to Dr. Durrani for an evaluation. So would Westchester refer patients to Dr. Durrani? Yes, they would. What was the substance of your conversations with Paula and Brian? Uh, essentially that uh, you know, they wanted to nurture that relationship you know, with uh, Dr. Durrani and CAST. Um, you know, they knew that uh, you know, business was coming over that way, and so they wanted to make sure that uh, you know, Dr. Durrani and, and, uh, and all his staff were, were catered to. Did Paula ever make any statement to you about uh, Dr. Durrani and her relationship? Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, the, the one statement that always sticks out in my head, and I had mentioned this a while back too, is just you know, you know, we're partners in crime. Uh, while Dr. Durrani was operating Westchester Hospital, do you know who the highest money maker for the hospital was? Uh, but Dr. Durrani made it very apparent that he was the top producer and was told that he was the top producer. Those were the kind of things that he would uh, come and tell us, and and that would that was something that was supposed to make us as a practice feel happy. That hey, you know, we're you know, we're a big part of this Westchester um, you know, operation, and you know, that's why they, they let us do what we want over there. And this, uh, yes, uh, as a matter of fact, I, I, at, w at one point, uh, from what I recall, he had been delinquent almost six months, not having done really any type of surgical notes. And so based on your experience working with multiple surgeons, uh, from conservative to aggressive, where would Dr. Durrani rank? Aggressive, very aggressive. What is your opinion of Dr. Durrani? So I use the I, I use the term you know narcissistic, but I would say you know you know arrogant, narcissistic. I mean even to the point where you know you, you're you're you know being put in jail, you know you you have um, you know you've you've in a sense hurt and like destroyed so many different people's lives, and yet you continue to do exactly what you're being put in jail for. Um, I've, I've we even had patients sometimes that actually went on and said. You know, I was told I needed to go and have surgery right away, and I hadn't even had an MRI. 
uh, about you know cast merging with uh, Westchester in some way, shape, or form. Potentially, you know, having a floor. Uh, there was, I think, an unoccupied floor. I can't remember if it was the third or fourth floor, but there was uh, some discussion taken taken place about uh, you know, potentially even having space up there. In your experience, how frequently did that happen? Well, it happened a, a fair amount because I would I would hear this from a, a number of patients. I mean, even to this day, I mean, I, I follow a couple of the, I follow a few of these patients, and they they still remember those those phrases you know being told to them, uh, you know, about paralysis, you know, and or their head falling off. And my opinion is he booked too many cases in one day. I was concerned that too many patients were open on the table waiting for him to come into the rooms. Um, how many would be open while he was waiting? Three to four. And uh, why is it a concern that three or four are open at one time? Anesthesia time. And if there's an issue in a case, the other patients are open and unattended. Okay. So uh, what is the issue with anesthesia specifically, or are there multiple issues? Well, the longer you're under anesthesia, you know, there's there's ramifications for that. It, did he do that regularly? Yes. Okay. He worked long hours, and the staff that were there had to work them too, and I was concerned about their fatigue. I couldn't speak to his level of, of um, fatigue, but the staff were very fatigued. The only thing I can recall is Shanti did a full report on a patient and Durrani was listed as the surgeon and he didn't go in that room. And was Dr. Durrani your boss? Yes. Did he tell you to perform this surgery? Yeah, the surgical plan was never m my input. You know, he would say, this is the plan. You know, this is what, you know, my, this is what I'm doing. And so that, that was it. It wasn't like, uh, you know, I'm thinking this versus this. It was already predetermined. This was his plan and I was just there. So that's where kind of where I felt like I was in the room too long. Um, uh, and that was really where I started my discomfort with it. Uh, because I, you know, at times I would kind of sit there, wait for him to get there to continue on with the procedure. Uh, what I thought to be certain, especially certain steps that were integral for him to complete. No, those issues that you just described. Uh, I mean, they, they, uh, they, you know, to me, they were they were pretty bad. You know, he, you know, he would show up late for cases. He would not be there for the entire case. Uh, he would start another case while this case was not com fully completed yet. You see any surgeon who's doing that large volume? Uh, you know, I think that's it's easy to say that he was aggressive in his indication. And, uh, you know, when I walk into the OR, at times, you know, we would look through the scans, and I would ask him, you know, what, you know, what's the reason for surgery, and he would say, oh, you know, he always had a kind of an answer. And I would look at the scans, and I would be like, well, me personally, I probably would not have operated on this person, you know, but not where I have direct access to the patient. Dr. Shahi, is there any question in your mind that Westchester Hospital knew about these all these issues that you've testified about pertaining to Dr. Durrani? Jackson. You know, I mean, er, you know, kind of was everything was kind of open. You know, I don't think there was any, as far as I know, I would, whatever was happening in Westchester, I would assume Westchester was aware of it. Jackson. And why would they have been aware of it? He would want people to know that he's very important. He would want people to know that, you know, he's he's an important figure to the, to cast to the hospital. That's kind of what he projected. That's how we communicate with me, the staff. So nothing was ever kept kind of. Like, you know, everything was kind of open right in front of you. My concerns were uh, regarding the indications for surgery and the appropriateness of surgery. I believe he had a serious complication as a result of which they had some meetings. And uh, I believe, again, his issue was medical record uh, documentation, but uh, he ended up resigning from Christ. And when you said that there were serious complications, uh, somebody actually died, is that right? I believe so. Objection. How about Good Samaritan Hospital? Were there any investigations that you're aware of that took place there? Yes. And what took place there? And uh, how did you come to be, how did you become concerned about Dr. Durrani's practice methods?
You're asking how I first became concerned? Yeah, how did you first become concerned? I imagine it was seeing patients who were coming to see me for a second opinion, and I felt that uh, I had a different opinion about the care of those patients. And did you believe that UC Health and Children's Hospital Medical Center, at that time that this email uh, came into your inbox, that they had things they needed to explain about Dr. Durrani? I believe that they would have been they would have been subject to questions, which is again, which is what we predicted. The questions would be asked. Um, you had been asking those questions, correct? What questions? The questions about Dr. Durrani's practice habits. We and had concerns. Did um, do you know if Christ did any investigation? Again, hearsay, but yes, I believe so. What do you know that Christ did? I yeah. believe he had a serious complication as a result of which they had some meetings, and uh, I believe again his issue was medical record uh, documentation. But uh, he ended up resigning from Christ. You said that there were serious complications. Uh, somebody actually died. Is that right? I believe so. Yeah. How about Good Samaritan Hospital, were there any investigations that you're aware of that took place there? Yes. And what took place there? I believe he had another serious complication as a result of which an investigation was performed. Did you ever uh, perform any surgeries with Dr. Durrani? Yes, I did. I had a handful of cases that I disagreed with the management. In all honesty, there was no cocktail hour where there was more than two orthopedic surgeons in the room that Dr. Johnny was not going to be part of the conversation. So Dr. Colosimo and maybe everyone else in town could have been. Based upon your knowledge and experience in the uh, various uh, patients you saw, did you have an opinion about Dr. Johnny's reputation in the Cincinnati area medical community as a spine surgeon? His reputation was one of being an aggressive surgeon. I agree it's a sad day for our profession where an orthopedic surgeon uh, is being accused of these issues. And did you believe that uh, the accusations had merit? Actually? Yes. So multiple people have said multiple things. He had research irregularities, a personal relationship with staff member. Uh, he was, I suppose some, someone had reported him to the board and the board had said that they were going to uh, investigate him and then he said that if you investigate me I'm going to resign. He said we have to investigate you and so he resigned. As I said earlier there really wouldn't be a single spine surgeon in town who didn't know about about this and we had conversations with a dozen spine surgeons in town. I understand. So prior to his indictment and him leaving the country, prior to that time? Prior to his indictment there wasn't any conversation at MEC about him. It wasn't until his indictment that it became subject of conversation. And you said it was common knowledge that he had issues dictating his operative reports and discharge summaries, correct? Yes. Yeah. I saw a patient who had surgery and the operative note was dictated nine months after the surgery. And did the operative note seem to be consistent with the uh, surgery that was performed? No. Well, you were frustrated with what was going yes. on, correct? And you expressed that frustration to people throughout the medical community, the spine community, correct? Yes. And in so doing, there was a lot of talk in the entire community about it. Absolutely. He, he submitted an abstract, uh, but then it had to get retracted. And I was actually at the meeting in Toronto when uh, they, it, was still on the, <laughs> it was still on the agenda. And they're standing there saying, where's Dr. Durrani? And then they said, okay, I guess he's not here, and they moved on. But it was still submitted, and uh, he never presented the actual research, though. It's he like submitted an abstract. So you, you submit an abstract saying, I have 99 patients who have done this technique or this surgery untreated in this way, and 99 out of 99 did very well, and which is the kind of stuff that then looks like, well, that can't be right because he had retracted it at that point, but it was too late to change the agenda. What were the surgeries, if you recall, that you scoped in on with Dr. Durrani at the Christ Hospital? Early 2005-06. And when you scrubbed in on those surgeries with Dr. Durrani, I assume you looked at records to see what the surgery was about and why the surgery was being done? No. Uh, did, you, uh, what, did you actually perform parts of the surgery? Yes. And. Uh, do you know if there were any complications from any of those surgeries in which you participated? No. Uh, did you see anything while you were doing those operations to indicate the surgeries were not indicated? Uh, 
I disagreed with one case where an anterior procedure was going to be followed by a posterior procedure. Did you raise that issue with Dr. Durrani? Yes. And uh, did Dr. Durrani explain to you why he was going to do the interior followed by the posterior? Yes. And was that satisfactory to you, his explanation? No. So why did you continue with the operation? I you did not. Indicated? You backed out? Yes. I remember in one conversation that I directly had with him that he was concerned and frustrated. I, I, my understanding was that an external review was done on his cases at Children's Hospital. Uh, prior to 2009, did you express your concerns to any of the spine doctors or administrative personnel at Children's? I remember this, the discussions I had were primarily with Dr. Melman and with Dr. Wall. I felt that uh, some of the patients that I was, some of the patients that I was seeing whom he had treated um, were not treated according to standard of care. I felt that the treatment was aggressive. I would again like to reiterate that the observation of significant concerns about Dr. Durrani's surgical indications was voiced by many members of the Cincinnati medical community all of which were relayed to our chairman, Dr. Peter J. Stern. Do you agree with that sentence? The word many uh, is, I don't know how many members of the Cincinnati community. I know that uh, we did. I remember, I don't remember whether I expressed it or it was a mutual, um, Basically, that the surgical treatment of pars fractures was, appeared to be very aggressive by Dr. Durrani. And what do you mean by aggressive? It was not according to standard of care. Which were the surgeries that concerned you? I believe uh, many of them involved pars repairs. At, this is specifically at Children's Hospital. Within the spine community, he did not have a good reputation. In the spine community, it was uh, felt that he was a very aggressive surgeon with his surgical indications. Right. I felt that his imaging studies did not, and his clinical presentation did not support surgical intervention. Mm -hmm. It was uh, the same concerns we've discussed about his surgical indications, um, in some cases not meeting standard of care. Okay, what about paralysis? What familiarity did you have with uh, complications of paralysis with Dr. Durrani's patients? Um, there was really one patient that I knew about. Are well, you aware sorry. that ultimately there were over 500 lawsuits filed against Dr. Durrani? I heard Objection. that. I did one surgery with him at Christ Hospital. My f it was my f probably my first week in practice. He asked me to, because uh, I had just started and I had really no patients to see and okay. it was my first week I think literally and he asked me to come and help him with, on a case. Okay and do you, do you remember whether in your professional opinion it was appropriate to operate on that patient? I remember not agreeing with the surgery. And with I that surgery? With that particular surgery. And yet yes. you did the surgery? With no I, I actually left for about an hour into it. And why is that? I just didn't agree with what was being done. However I was you know, so, so when I came back in 2008 is when things had changed. We felt they should be investigated. And what was that conversation with Dr. Wall, if you recall? I don't recall it in great detail, but I uh, expressed the concerns that Dr. Guanciale had, had relayed or written to me. And uh, I told him that uh, I wanted to look uh, this must be looked into. He was a little reluctant at first, and I told him that uh, if he didn't look into it, I would contact legal counsel at Children's Hospital and ask them to look into it. Uh, based on that letter, I felt that uh, I needed to, in my capacity as chair, I needed to discuss his concerns with the individuals at the Children's Hospital Medical Center. 
I only know that uh, Dr. Durrani resigned very shortly after that meeting. When did he resign? I can't tell you the specific date, but it was, uh, I would almost swear that it was within 10 to 14 days of that meeting. It was quite precipitous. I mean, making these kind of allegations against a, a peer in the community is pretty serious, isn't it? Yes. Did you uh, inform Dr. Crawford? About, I informed Dr. Eric Wall at a point. Okay. Yeah. Let's well, start with Crawford. Did you ever tell Dr. Crawford you were doing this? I recall at the time that Dr. Eric Wall was, uh, seemed to be the person who was the, in charge of all of orthopedics children's, and so I really, uh, want Dr. Cro uh, Dr. Uh, Eric Wall know, yes. So, so Dr. Wall was informed that you and your residents in Ab Agabagi and Aska were reviewing imaging studies from children's on Dr. Durrani's patients. No, no, that. no. Dr. Wall was informed that uh, the residents were uh, presenting concerns about surgeries uh, being performed by Dr. Durrani. I, um, I had more conversation with Dr. Wall about the research. Okay. You testified that you spoke with Dr. Wall regarding the research issue, correct? I did. Okay. And, uh, I called him from Toronto. Okay. And did he confirm your concerns? He did. Do you know why Dr. Durrani was able to continue to perform surgeries after his resignation at Children's Hospital Medical Center? No. Were you aware that he was continuing to yes. do surgeries? Uh, did you have an issue or a problem with that? It was, that was a, a, very, a, a serious, um, inappropriate sexual relationship. We addressed it through HR and the issue never got resolved. You know, we set up an action plan, it never, Dr. Durrani did not comply with that action plan. Dr. Durrani's HR problems were becoming an issue with his employment at this point because he was violating hospital policy. Isn't it true that there were serious concerns being raised by Dr. Guanciola, Guanciali about Dr. Durrani that led to this meeting with Dr. Stern and Dr. Aziza Khan, correct? Yes. Because of all those issues I was talking to you about, the HR issues, the research issues, is he was becoming as division director, he was taking it up an inordinate amount of my time. And so is so I would say I would have liked him to get, you know I didn't want him in my division anymore. You wanted him to move on. Yes. Right? Well I yeah, I just I didn't want to be taking care of him. All right, and that wasn't just I take it yeah. Wasn't just the HR issues. Uh, but it was all, all of the surgical issues that were coming up as well, correct? Objection. I know, I'd say it was all the issues. 